morning. I'm Molly Starback from the postdoc office, and we're going to be very informal because we have a small crowd. So feel free to ask questions whenever you like. And we are super excited to welcome all of our panelists. Thank you so much for coming, y'all. We have um, Catherine Dickerson, who uh, Katie, who is a postdoc scholar in cognitive neuro. She was an award, award awarded an F32 from. Um, from NIMH, and she was also awarded a KL2 through the Duke CTSA, and was recently promoted to assistant professor in has been uh, psychiatry and behavioral sciences. So congratulations, Katie. <laughs> and Casey Gordon is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Biology. She was an awarded an F32 from NIGMS. Erin Kaltenberg is a post science. <laughs> yes, medical science. Yeah, thank you. So I don't, again, she's only one of two F32s on the arts and sciences side of campus. So everybody else is basically in the medical center, so interesting. And Erin Kaltenbrun is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology. Her F32 is from NCI. And Ryan Schweller is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and his F32 is from NHLBI. And um, we had some questions submitted in advance, so we'll start with those. Um, but like I said, feel free to shout out your questions, and or maybe not shout out. But um, and so we'll start with a brief intro from our panelists. They'll tell us a little bit about their background, their department, their area of research, how long they've been a the postdoc, or in Katie's case, recently promoted. So would you like to start, Katie? Sure. Okay. Um, I started at Duke uh, in November of 2011 as a postdoc, and I was here as a postdoc fully for the five-year time and then was promoted exactly at the right time and I would have had to change titles anyway. Um, so I, yeah, I sit in the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. I was actually first affiliated with the Neurobiology Department because I was on T32 when I came in um, for a year. And then after that, I was associated with the Psychiatry Department because that's where my mentor's uh, primary appointment is. Um, and I do work using real-time fMRI. So standard fMRI, but then we show people what changes are happening in their brain in real time, so it's like a type of biofeedback. Um, and I'm doing work on that in healthy individuals and clinical populations. Um, yeah. Thank you. Casey. I'm Casey. I came to Duke in 2015, first week of 2015. Um, it was the week my daughter turned one. So I kind of had to figure out the timing, we'll talk about this a little bit later, eligibility-wise of when do you defend, when do you get your degree, when do you start your postdoc, and like which clocks are running during these intervals, because I had a kid in the meantime, a PhD um, thesis baby. <laughs> so I came in the first week of January 2015, applied for the fellowship by the end of that year, and it was awarded the following spring. Um, and so I was in my second year when, it, when the funding came through. Um, and so I work in Dave Sherwood's lab and we study cell biology and nematode worms. I worked on C. elegans gene regulation in an evolutionary biology program in grad school and so I switched topics but not organisms when I started my postdoc. And that's actually one of the things we were just looking at this little score sheet that you're graded on for your F32 is training potential and so it helps to kind of switch directions from what you did your PhD. Casey's also the president of the Duke University Post Office Association, proving the maxim if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. Erin. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I started my postdoc January 2014. Um, so I applied that very first cycle for the F32 um, and then didn't get it and reapplied the following year. Um, so I was on a T32 when I entered, and then I switched over to an F32 when my F32 was activated. And um, so yeah, now, now I'm at about three and a half year mark. Um, yeah, so I guess you can kind of, I don't know. When I started my postdoc, it's a little bit fuzzy because my mentor wasn't at Duke yet. And so I kind of was officially a Duke employee without actually being at Duke for a little while. And so that gave me my time to really put it together in those kind of first six months. So kind of really started here, um, kind of January 2013. And then, um, yeah, um, my work is just primarily focused on um, biomaterials development. And since I'm National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, you know that it's biomaterials for the promotion um, of uh, vascularization, angiogenesis, and I understand how we can build materials to help us study that. Does 
some corrections. Oh, I guess I forgot to say what I worked on. <laughs> so my lab works on RAS genes, which are um, oncogenes, act as oncogenes in lots of cancers. So my work focuses on one particular gene in the RAS family that's mutated the most often. Um, and so my work focuses on understanding features of that gene that make it a better oncogene than other members of the family. I'll describe your experience applying for the F32. I don't know if any of you had to reapply. I reapplied. Okay, good. So if you can talk about that, and clearly it, it didn't crush your dreams because <laughs> you had to yeah, so. and my I mean my my first application was basically triage. Like I fell into the top two percent of all grants, and my resubmission scored at four percent. So I like made a huge leap up from being like the bottom of the pile. Um, so when you yeah. first applied, had you started your research yet? Or was there, it, okay. So I came in in Such January, and I think okay. I, like I did the spring. I was mm -hmm. I did the spring date. So I because I wanted to like have so the time with the timing for the F32. I think your eligibility ends two years after your degree conferral date, and so you really kind of have to get started early, especially if you want to give yourself time to do a resubmission. Because basically, once you reach that eligibility deadline, you're no longer eligible for it. So they really want early postdocs. They really want to fund you early on in your postdoc. So you really have to get the ball rolling early. So what I will say is that I didn't really feel like I got dinged by my reviewers because I didn't have preliminary data. But if you don't have preliminary data, you have to build a case, a really strong case based on literature and really convince your reviewers that even though you don't have preliminary data, that you have a really strong command of the field. And so I didn't do that very well in my first application, and so I really like, I really expanded my, um, like my rationale, I added like, I doubled the number of references in my second application. Um, and I, I used absolutely like every bit of um, space allocated, which I think is important. <laughs> References are the only part of this application with no page limit. That's right. So <laughs> pile them in. Yeah. <laughs> um, you really want to convince your reviewers that you've thought hard about your project and that you have a really good command of the field um, and set a really good platform for your studies, even if you don't have preliminary data to necessarily support everything that you're su suggesting that you're going to do. So I think you have to just use you have to use the literature really well, especially if you're applying really early on. But I don't think they necessarily care that you don't. They don't expect you to have preliminary. Did you get a summary statement? Mm -hmm. Even you weren't discussed. Okay. Yeah, yes. you get a summary statement. Yes, you get a summary statement, but you, you don't, don't get a score. You don't get a score. Okay. If you don't get a score, you know you fell into the bottom 50%. They only score the top 50%. So the summary statement is what used to be called the pink sheet, right? The reviewers' comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can't remember how many reviewers I had. Two. Usually it's okay. three. But so you might have had two. Yes, I, I want to echo that um, preliminary data is not necessary. Um, and if you don't have any preliminary data, I would really um, highly suggest reaching out to your mentor because there might be kind of some data floating around in the lab, whether published or unpublished, that you can really put in there to help at least motivate um, what you want to do. And that's one thing that I kind of hinged uh, my application uh, a bit on. So. That's, that's kind of an alternative way, because I very much switched fields. I didn't do any biomaterials for my PhD, so it was kind of starting over. But being able to put that in there, I think, um, gave concreteness to the application. Mm -hmm. How did you, so did you, um, I guess, how did you frame that? Like, is your training potential that there's this data and then I have experts, is that how you framed it? Or yeah, a little bit in that way. So the, the lab had developed some technologies and had some, some basic kind of background knowledge in what I was uh, kind of proposing that I was gonna do. And then I really spun it as to how I was going to develop that based upon kind of my background training. I also submitted twice. So like I said, I started in the fall of 2011 and then I submitted August of 2012, I think my first time. And my goal was just to get scored, as we were saying, like it's, it's you know, it, it's just helpful to have be in the top half and know kind of roughly where you are. So I think my uh, impact score was like maybe a 35, and the percentile translated to like 31st percentile, um, which we thought was like great for the first time around. And um, 
and then feedback that you get from the reviewers is super helpful. Yeah, and it gives you something to respond to. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to apply early so there's enough time for you to be able to respond mm -hmm. to reviewers and resubmit. Yeah, definitely. So then I, I did that, like I tried to just talk like address every single point in excruciating detail. Yeah. <laughs> you get a one page cover sheet that you can re respond to the comments and then in your application you can like track your changes basically about all the things that you did. Um, and so I ended up submitting actually a full year later in August of 2013 just I think timing wise. I was trying to uh, get more papers out I think. Um, and then I got a much better uh, score for percentile ranks in. And we were actually we were also looking at the things so they score you <coughs> yourself, like you as the applicant, your mentor and your mentorship team that you've prepared, the research plan that you've written, your training potential, and then the environment. And happily at Duke, yeah. I feel like the Duke always gets a perfect environmental yeah. score. So that's great. And each of those things are scored from one to nine. So one being the best to nine being the worst. And then they multiply by ten to give you your uh, impact score. Yeah, so I think the things that you don't really have necessarily the most control over as an applicant, like for instance, if you joined a lab and, you ha and you're working for an assistant professor, maybe they don't have a very long training background yet, mm -hmm. what a lot of people do is they, they just get a co-sponsor, mm -hmm. which is a much more established faculty member on their application. And so lots of people do that that have, that have a younger investigator um, sponsors. So that's something you can do if you have a, a mentor that doesn't have a long training record. Because those are fairly important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did that. I pulled in a co-sponsor because the project I'm working on in the lab was something that was new for the lab. And so my advisor had never published on the worm's germline before, had always been focusing on this other anatomical worm part. Um, so I just wrote to a person in the field that I knew for research. My advisor at our conferences and just said, and this is my project, here are my interests, would you please co-sponsor? And she wrote a letter, or I may have written it for her. She's a kid. <laughs> and then her just her bio sketch got uploaded as well. It just gives you a little bit more um, of the bona fides. They're like, oh, this is probably going to work. And then all by yourself, trying to stab mm -hmm. blindly. I didn't resubmit an NRSA, but I submitted in the last deadline of the year. I think it's December. They're April, August, and December. Oh, so that's right. Yeah. Yeah. August, November, something like that. So I've been in the lab for nine, ten months, and I had submitted applications for Jane Coffin Child, Helen Hayworthy, David Runyon, and gotten, not gotten any of those, and they don't give you any feedback, they just say, like, dear applicant, no. And so, like, you can't kind of go point by point. Um, so we kind of had to guess what it was that was not going with those versions of the application. That's when I added the co-sponsor, and I think that that really did help. And I will say for the training environment, um, on top of like what the rank of the faculty member is and their kind of training background, they also definitely do look at what their funding situation is. So from that standpoint, do keep that in mind. And so therefore, if, even if the funding is good, but they just don't have a long track record of like NIH funding, it might be worthwhile to get that co-sponsor who just has a track record of NIH, um, NIH funding. So that's kind of another kind of component they look at. So they may be really well published, and all that stuff, but they definitely do look at what the funding um, climate is for the lab that you're in. Yeah, because your mentor still has to fund the research. You know, the F32 only pays for your salary, so your PI still needs to be able to pay for the work. Um, I also had to write a memo. Did you guys have to write a memo? Mm -hmm. After, so, uh, I, I, there might have just been a program different, program officer differences, so I think she, uh, she was wonderful, but I, um, so after the second time around when I got scored, it was very high, but she still felt uncomfortable about committing to it being funded. So they don't make the funding decisions. The program officers just advocate for you because they're not the one making the choice. So I think it was in the sixth percentile, and I was like, oh, wow, that's a big difference. And people usually say, like, I think the cutoff is maybe roughly around 20-ish. Mm -hmm. I yeah, think it'd be too maybe, high. It yeah, might depend maybe on more that. recently. I remember historically it hovered around like 27 for many years. Okay. And the last couple cycles, I don't know what it is. Okay. It's quite, F32, the funding cutoff is quite a bit higher mm -hmm. than for like R01s. Um, 
but I think she just wanted to feel like as fully informed as possible, so she had me write a memo addressing all of the points from the second revision, so then I like Oh, yeah, detailed yeah. everything out so that when she went into the room and talked to the reviewers, she could really advocate, well, we know Katie was still doing on this, but she's promised blah, 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 or here's her explanation. But I think that is probably depends on your burden. And did you get the same reviewers both times, or do you have any way of knowing? I don't, know I don't think you know how to know. Yeah. Did they print out who was on the study section? Yeah, but those are all ad hoc. Those yeah. are all ad hoc. Those aren't standing study sections. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. And there are always weird personal differences. I remember yeah. I just was looking at my summary statement, and one of the reviewers was like, she had a very productive PhD. And the other was like, another why didn't like, she have more papers? <laughs> 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 I always have one reason that's like, she was, she was yeah. reasonably productive. And somebody else will be like, I feel like she should have gotten what she's done. <laughs> so, yeah. so those are the kind of just, yeah. that might make the difference with your research. And those comments are also, frankly, unhelpful. Yeah. Once yeah. you're like applying, it's not like you can alter those facts. Step one, go back in time. Yeah. So that brings up one of the questions we had, though, like um, when, you know, when do you know or can you know in terms of publications and research when you should apply or should you just be like, I don't apply because, you know, the clock is ticking and I've only got two years. I never even considered applying until I, like, was in my actual postdoc lab. I know that some people do before that, but yeah. You need a letter from a potential postdoc mentor mm -hmm. if you're doing it before. Yeah. yeah. But. And you're allowed to change the location, the PI, and the project. You can change two, but not three of those things. So I couldn't mm -hmm. take the remaining funds that I have and move to a different university, work on something else with a different person. But I could work on something else within my mentor's lab here, which I think probably happens a lot, is that your, yeah, your sure. research evolves from what you wrote when you were in your first year. Or you can, you could presumably keep working on your project someplace else. Um, but you, but they do kind of want some continuity because you're, they're awarding you the grant partly on the strength of your training environment, and you can't just scrap all that stuff, mm -hmm. keep the money. I would say just go ahead and apply, yeah. regardless. That would be my, and if you do get dinged from someone saying that, oh, you weren't as productive as a PhD student, which you really don't have any control of over at that point, you know, that's when you just go back to your PhD mentor and say, hey, I need my letter to really state something mm -hmm. like, I developed a new area in this lab, and so mm -hmm. henceforth my publications weren't as, you know, numerous mm -hmm. as potentially similar colleagues, but, you know, the work that I did led to, you know, new funding for the lab, new areas, I don't know, patents, anything along those lines could really uh, potentially help in that regard. And I would argue that when you've just joined a lab is really a really good time to write a fellowship because you haven't really started anything yet. You, you don't have momentum on a project where you want to take yourself away and like bury yourself in the literature. So I would say like when you enter a lab is the best time to do it because you don't really need preliminary data. Um, you know, it's a really great time to steep yourself in the literature of the field before you get started, um, rather than like work full on for like seven or eight months and then remove yourself and have to come back and sit and write your fellowship at that point. It is a lot of work. Yeah. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. I agree. I think it's hard to know. I think I only had three, I think I had three papers. And one was from undergrad. Mm -hmm. I was in the middle of the undergrad, one was at first out there. Moments of review paper, and all of them are a little grumpy about that, but not grumpy enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question? Um, so I have two questions. The first is, you said you only you have you only have two years from the time you graduate your PhD. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's helpful because I'm probably not eligible then. But this is good for other <laughs> purposes. Um, I would read through it because there are some. I just I, I haven't yeah. seen that deadline, so I yeah I was actually right. looking it yesterday and I couldn't figure out where they posted that either. Yeah, I, I, that's the first time I've heard that because I can't, I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, Do you think that depends on the agency? It could. Yeah, I don't remember yeah, that rule either. So, I, I just looked this up and um, if you read the FOA, it says eligibility and the wording isn't, they've changed the wording recently. So it says like, um, 
two years not considering like major health issues, having a child. Mm -hmm. Like so if it's in there and there are um, exceptions and then if you talk to the program officer, um, they've been really nice with me about eligibility, so okay. I think that's the way is the same and it lists all the institutions. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. If it's in yeah. the FOA it's probably it applies to everything. Yeah, yeah. The thing I couldn't remember is that it, is it is it two years from the degree? Yeah, it, I I remember it being two years from the degree conferred, but then I couldn't remember if it was for your first application it has to be two years, and then your resubmission can be after that. Mm -hmm. That's what I couldn't exactly remember, but yeah, you have to look into it a little more closely. I think. But that's a good time to ask the program officer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you guys all talk to your program officers? Were they helpful? Yeah, I mean, I didn't work with a program officer that early on. Not until after I was probably like on my resubmission, maybe. Yeah. I didn't talk to my program officer. Yeah, I don't think I really interacted with my program officer until I got the grant, or until I got my score. Like score. Yeah, 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 until yeah. I got scored mm -hmm. and had some idea of like whether or not I was likely to be. Yeah, mine was similar. After, like I said, I, I interacted with her a lot after I got yes. this second one, and she was super helpful. And she was, she was, it was great because she was also the program officer for the loan repayment program oh. at the time, which I also applied for, and I did not get that. And that I didn't get any. I think that they don't give any comments. I'm not sure if they still don't. But. Um, it was great because she was in the room and she was able to tell me like, well, this is what they said about you. And I was like, oh, great. So very, very helpful. But I would encourage you to talk to them ahead of time. Um, I just, I think I just didn't know that that was a thing. Um, but I have a friend who's applying who just applies for an F32 and she talked to her program officer beforehand and sent specific games. And you definitely want to have like, Go to them prepared, though. Don't be like, I have this idea, mm -hmm. you know. So she sent like a full draft of specific games and wanted concrete feedback. So they're very, you know, they're busy people. But um, and they were super helpful. And actually, the first idea she had, they were like, this is too complicated. It's not going to get funded. Mm -hmm. And the second idea that she had was great. She got a very good score. So. So how do you find the program officer, and that would be right for your field and your. Mm -hmm. So I think based on the like the sub the agency, so for NIMH, I, th I think that they're listed. You might have to poke around with the internet a little bit, but they should all be listed there online. And then you can just just email them out of the loop. Just yeah. pick one. I think that for there might only be like the there should be only a couple two? points of contact. Yeah. And if you and you always want to email them first, and they will forward it on. If nothing, they will put you in contact yeah. with the proper person. If nothing else. And the people in the grants administration office of your department here at Duke should have also yeah. some. Oh yeah, they might, they might be true. able to point you towards somebody that yeah. has worked with previous fellowship. Mm -hmm. They do change though, so like I know yeah. for NIMH, it's the person who I worked with is different than the person now. And did um, any of you, did you know which agency you were going to apply to, or were you like, I can apply to this one, I can apply to that one? Did you, how, how did you pick the agency? Was it obvious or? Mine was obvious because there's only one cancer institute. <laughs> I, I did general medical science, which is just sort of not super medical. It's just like I study biology. And that would have only been the only one right for me. It's very basic cell biology. In your cover letter, you can identify um, the institute. And, you, and it's not against the rules to identify multiple institutes. Um, and they will end up assigning it to an institute based upon what they feel is most appropriate, that's even if that's not what you list on your yeah, cover letter. Yeah, I think in your cover letter you just ask it yeah. to be sent somewhere, but they ultimately decide. So, right? obviously, talk to your, wherever your advisor is, whatever institute they're going through is probably the appropriate one, but there could be differences, but you can totally list multiple. Yeah, the other thing that happened when I was submitting um, is that they, what happens within some institutes is sometimes they'll decide that one particular area of research they want to really focus on, and so they'll initiate, they'll have these initiatives. And so when I was reapplying, they had just established an initiative to study RAS genes. And so in my cover letter, I said, this is in response, this grant is in response to this specific initiative in this institution. 
So look to see if there's any of that in institutions that are affiliated in your field because sometimes they will be specifically looking for proposals that they want to fund that are in specific areas that they're really throwing money at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I could have gone to either an IMH or possibly NIDA if I had sent mine a little more drug because I was mm -hmm. studying the dopamine system so I really can go either way. But I went more of a mental health route. Um, but I would say you absolutely want to look a lot, spend a lot of time looking at the agency's funding priorities and use that language in your grant. So like bold underlined, mm -hmm. consistent with NIMH's strategic you know, plan or their funding priorities, we are addressing blah, blah, blah. You want to make the grant as easy for the reviewers to read and you know, highlight those key statements so that when they're scoring you, they can say, oh, is she, is she consistent with the funding priorities of NIH? Yep, it's right there, you know. What's her yeah. proposal? You know, like, what are her research questions? Just make it all very clear um, so that they don't have to search for whether you're, you know, whether you're in line with their priorities. And you will feel kind of goofy, just like copying yeah. a sentence from a website <laughs> and pasting it into your grant. Like, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but in the case of grant writing, you kind of are. So, like, a really well written grant and really good writing, like not really the same thing. But it helps because yeah. the people that are reading these are going to read a big stack of them. Yeah. And if they have a little checklist of like, here's our rubric, we're going for these five priorities, and if you just give it to them in a bold underlined silver spoon, they're going to be so yeah. glad. And just check, check, check. They'll be in a happy mood with you. That's it. The requirements in general, some of them are weird. Just do them exactly. Right. Like they're, it's the sort of thing where, you know, if they say they want it to be 20 lines long, make it 20 lines long. If, you know, they say organize it like this, organize it like that. It just makes it easier for the people that are reviewing it, and then you know that you're not going to get dinged for a stupid reason. I had a reviewer almost not submit a letter, and I added so that you had to have at least three recommendation letters, and I added a fourth at the very last minute, like put his name and sent the little email with the link for him to go because reviewer number three was just not responding to my reminders. Hey, you gotta upload this by tomorrow. Just, yeah, those little things where other people can kind of screw it up for you. Try to give yourself some insurance. And a fourth reference letter, like if the guy had come through at the last minute, would have been fine. Um, oh, and okay, another so thing mentioned. along those lines was oh. ask people to see their successful grants, but understand that the rules probably have changed since they submitted it. Because even since I submitted in the beginning of 2015, there's now like what used to be three separate short documents has to be one document. Yeah, they the kind of keep making the length shorter too. <coughs> like every cycle, it seems like they like crunch it down a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. But pay attention to like the margin requirements mm -hmm. and the font requirements because you can like you can get a lot of extra space if you go all the way out to like their minimum requirements or everything. But I wouldn't go beyond that. No, definitely like, don't go beyond that. It is so frustrating to look at a grant where you cannot read the figure legend. Yeah. So it just yeah. makes people miserable. So make sure that your grant yeah. is like, you know, legible and clear. And I think using white space is, is not bad if it's, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want gaping holes, but I think like trying to maximize the space is really great, but you also feel like, like Peyton was saying, they're reading a million of these, and so it gets very exhausting. So if it's well laid out and not totally jammed, that can also be good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you mentioned, we laughed, but you mentioned writing a letter for somebody. And yeah. Then, and Sometimes that'll... You can totally results. do that. I think it's <coughs> a liberty of dropping yeah. this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because you get better results that way sometimes with busy busy people. With busy people, or also if the, you know, if, if it's clear that the co-sponsor is because there's this aspect of your project where your PI doesn't have any experience and you don't have any experience, then you really need your co-sponsor to write to that. And so saying, even if, you, if, even if they don't ask you to draft the whole letter, just giving them some like heads up, here's, here are the aims, here's what I really need your support with or your guidance with, just help them know how to write the best letter for you. Just heads up, letters of reference have to be uploaded through the ERA Commons yep. website. So if you write a letter of recommendation for yourself, it still needs to be submitted by right. them.
write that in your personal statement that like you took time off for kids and did that go over well? I didn't because the time I was still well within my window of eligibility <clears throat> for the runyon. I was pushing it, and it was like I it was one of these silly things where the submission deadline I was still eligible, but the date that they were meeting to review the applications, I was going to be like my graduation date was in between those. And so just in case, I wrote like a little paragraph about how, you know, I hoped that since I spent six months sitting on a couch with a toddler, like, please consider this anyway. But for the NRSA, I didn't, I didn't think I needed to. In your bio sketch, there is like, tell us about you as a person. And, and I think that a lot of people, there are pros and cons to including details about your, your really personal life, sort of like, I love sports because I strive for excellence in everything I do. Like that's what Dave writes in his bias sketch about himself, and you know how that goes over compares compared to like I'm a mom of a young child who makes a lot of demands on my time and just can't wait for anything, and I have to prioritize her over my work. That might not go over the same way, you know. So this is there's double standards everywhere. But you kind of have to judge whether you think it's a helpful or unhelpful. I think if there's like a like if you had a gap in your publications or things like that, then that you could contribute to anything like an illness or a sick parent or having a child or whatever. Then I think you can say that in a like a matter of the fact way. You know, like I took this time off or you know whatever. Um, I think that 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 is probably useful. Yeah, and if you search around, there is. There, it is explicitly stated kind of where that can be added into your application and what in different places. And the one other thing I would kind of um, kind of mention along those lines is don't be afraid to be redundant about yeah. things throughout your documents because there's a good chance that someone might read your bio sketch and your specific aims but never your whole document or some different combination of your um, your paperwork. So it's not it doesn't hurt you to feel like you're stating the same thing in like three different documents in that application. Because they basically explicitly ask you to. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that's a very good point. I, in my specific, I don't know if you guys did this, but in my specific games page, the aims which were like, you know, yeah. molded, I literally copied and yep. pasted throughout the rest of the document. I think that also really helps the reviewers too, so they're yeah. not rephrasing things yeah. all the time and they have to like put in cognitive effort. Right. Does this mean the same thing or it's not? not really a creative, like, piece of literature. <laughs> Yeah, it's a mix of like you want to sell the science, but you also want it to like you have to think of these poor people who are stuck in a windowless room for like 15 mm -hmm. hours and are exhausted, and you just want it to be easy and clear. So yeah, right. and also so the the way that you'll submit a grant if you haven't submitted a grant before here, there's a grants.do webpage, and you have to upload each document separately in like PDF titled whatever it is they tell you to title it. And then you push a button at the end, and it concatenates everything together, and is going to be what the final submission looks like. And then that's the thing that somebody in the grants office pushes the button and it gets sent to the NIH. It's helpful, I think, to print out that whole yeah. thing, because until that moment, you don't really know what's the order that somebody's going to read this in. So I would say try not to be submitting this like at 4.45, the day that it's due, because there are always something like, there is some silly document that has to be exactly 20 lines long or no more than whatever. And I put line numbers in that Word document and didn't notice that I left them in until I printed out the whole thing and thought, oh crap, this looks stupid. And so then I had to go call back the submission from grants.duke and set, upload the document without the junky stuff and resubmit. Um, but printing out the whole thing is helpful because not only will people read different components of it or read them in a weird order, but they're going to be presented in a certain order. And if someone's just flipping straight through, you want to make sure that the first thing they see that describes your project is the way you want it to be, knowing now that it's the very first description of this project you're going to see, so that, that sort of thing is helpful. There are uh, internal deadlines for some of the sections too, so talk to your grants person, because I think it's the budget, the abstract, maybe the like, budget, budget summary, yeah. I don't know. There's yeah. A few yeah. If you're working with like a grant administrator, which hopefully most, yeah. most of you will, they should ask you for certain pieces mm -hmm early on because they have to kind of like 
upload a bunch of like administrative information, like the, the budget and all of that stuff, and all of the Duke, the Duke institutional information, and they'll do that before you upload all of your documents. Okay. And likewise, your PI should have some of the documents. I submitted them as written by Dave, like a list of equipment in the lab, and, yeah. and other funding sources, and you know his training record, all of those things. You don't have to write from scratch. Hopefully. Hopefully, Hopefully if you yeah. have an organized PI. <laughs> yeah, or anyone else in the lab that's ever anyone written. Anyone else in yeah. the lab or the department. Or the department, it, yeah. It's really like a list of microscopes. It's yeah. the most boring thing in the world right. to have to do by yourself when you're doing all this other, yeah, more time, more. And the other thing, thing I would say that the, I feel like in the last few cycles, the NIH is increasingly putting importance on is they really now want postdocs to have like a mentorship committees so they really want you to have like groups of faculty members or a group of faculty members that's sort of monitoring your progress through your postdoc and like monitoring, um, sort of like providing support for you to achieve your career aims. Um, and in fact, I can't remember what it's called now, but I feel like the NIH is, is even formalizing, in the process of formalizing this requirement. So I don't know if they're asking for that yet. Um, they weren't asking for it formally when I applied, but we included it anyway, and I think as a rule, probably should because I have a feeling they're going to formalize it at some point in time anyway. Were you asked for IDPs, individual yeah. development plans? Right. Yeah, they didn't ask for that in my application, but I think that's something that they're formalizing now. And Duke doesn't have one yet, which is a little bit problematic, but they will, but Duke is like, well, it's, it's, it's voluntary, so just do it. Yeah, I think the, the actual question is, it's like, do you, do your trainees have an IDP? Yeah. And you can say yes or no, but most mentors probably think they should say yes. Right, so do <laughs> saying no is a bad idea. Saying so. no is a bad idea, but when I got this question, because I- These are individual development plans? Yeah, and yeah. There, is, there is a template on the Office of Postdoctoral Services website. Right, and Dr. Duke I communicated to me that they don't, or at least my department, I think it's departmental mm -hmm. um, differences, but my department communicated to me that they don't formally have a plan. Um, so if your department says, well, we don't have one, then use the template and just make one. And the evaluation, which everybody's supposed to be getting um, yearly, that's based on the IDP as well. So if you take a look at that, it's very similar to an IDP. Mm -hmm. And there's not like one set way to do an IDP. We would all love it if NIH would just say, yeah. here's the form, fill it out. But they haven't done that yet. But so you can take a look at samples and see which one fits you best. Yeah. But the F32 does ask you for your personal, professional goals. Mm -hmm. You have to describe them. And I think kind of regardless of what they are for real, for the purposes of asking the NIH for money, it's like, do research. It has human health <laughs> relevance forever. And so <laughs> that, you know, your, as far as this project is concerned, you're going to go on the job market for tenure track jobs at research universities or liberal arts colleges where you can run a lab and train undergrads too. Like that's pretty much, I think, the universe of possible. Or, a clinical side is not something that I'm familiar with, but like that's that's kind of what you're writing about. Because they're making an investment. That's another thing. So there's a payback for the F32. Um, so the, if yeah. you quit your postdoc and open a cupcake shop after six months of getting paid, you have to pay the money back to the NIH. So yeah, so your first year, you are incurring the payback obligation that you then work off during your second year. And then if you get a third year, third year's free. But you, if you got like a job job and kept working in science, that repays your payback obligation. But I think that, and I don't know, like I haven't seen a, a whole list of what repays the payback obligation. Like, I what actually kind had of a conversation things. about this with my program yeah. officer, and she was like, basically, if we can reasonably, yeah, it just has to be associated with yeah. science. If, doing, yeah. if we can, like, if it's if it's anywhere within the realm of like yeah. this is a reasonable transition, mm -hmm. and that like the NIH supported your transition, and at least you're still staying in science, yeah. like you're fine. But yeah. yeah, like maybe if you were literally starting a cupcake okay. shop, that would be like a harder, <laughs> would be harder to like suggest yeah. that the NIH made a good investment there. But <laughs> yeah, if it's if you're staying in science, you should be fine. I think the minimum is like 20 hours a week too. 20 yeah. hours a week of t and teaching counts. Teach so yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good. Yeah, so really, I think you only really have to worry about it if you want to leave your postdoc in the first year of your F32 mm -hmm. because right. they are pretty hard lined on like they want you to stay. Yeah. And do exactly what you yeah. said you're going to do 
for that first year. And in the second year, they're more willing to support a transition to something else. So maybe you could um, talk about the relative weights of the various sections. So do you feel like the research plan, seems like that would get the most weight, but do you think that the career plan, the responsible conduct of research plan, did those The research plan is weighted? important, but I, I just mentioned that I looked at my summary statement this morning. Sorry, I'll give you guys accurate information. And one of the comments, I got a comment where I was like, so the research plan is like, it seems reasonable, it's not super well developed, but she is just starting. So, you know, so that, like at this stage in your career, they understand, um, kind of like Erin was saying earlier, that you're just getting started. You don't have a ton of preliminary data. You know, you're going to test some hypotheses. You might find out, oh, no, well, that's not how it works pretty quickly. But at least you're in an environment and you're working with people and that you yourself have a track record of doing the research. And so, okay, we'll, we'll take a chance on it. And I think that it would be a mistake to spend so much time trying to make the research plan perfect that you neglect the other stuff because it is very important and, and it's not hard to do. So the training stuff, I'm going to go to this meeting in this city on that date, you know, I'm going to do an in-house seminar in my department, I'm going to, I mentor, you know, two undergrad students that each work 10 hours a week, like these kind of things are also important and so don't, don't neglect those because it's important to the mission of the NIH as well and it's a kind of an easy way to score points it doesn't depend on like, oh, I gotta get this data at the last minute. Yeah, you know, I mean, the data is a training grant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the training, and the way that it's scored, like they're pretty much all weighted equally mm -hmm. at the end of the day. The, the reviewers can weight it however they wish. Is how they can technically do it. But yeah, I would tend to agree though. I think that your your biggest things are going to be yourself. So you know, more from like your bio sketch, personal statement. So what your background is, your mentor. So does your mentor have a good track record of doing that? And then at that point, I think that it's just really on you to put together specific games and um, kind of experimental approach that is unique, is relatively sound, you know, just makes makes sense and, um, and seems achievable. But I think that they really are looking more at what your letters of rec are, your your background and your, your advisor are going to be the big things, and of course your institution, but I think, as people indicated earlier, um, I feel like Duke generally gets pretty good scores in terms of institutional environment, so you yeah, should I have mean, that Yeah, some, some things set. are pretty much going to be, you know, they are what they are. <clears throat> you know, your sponsor has the training record that he has. Your institution has the resources that it has. So as long as you include all of that in a way that you've obviously paid attention to including those pieces um, thoroughly, then the thing that you really have the most control over in terms of controlling your score is going to be your research plan. So, I mean, for my application, I literally didn't change anything from my first submission to my second submission except for my research strategy, and it completely turned my application from unfundable to fundable. So it can, like, turn it over, but that's assuming all the other pieces are already in place. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the training stuff is important, and being yeah. really detailed, I mean, it's like obnoxiously detailed, like, I'm going to yeah. go to these five seminars, and I'm going to take these classes, Yeah, I mean, and they even these made you, like, estimate the percentage of time during the week that you're going to spend <laughs> on, like, each individual thing, and you're yeah. like, oh, no. <laughs> just really, really detailed, yeah. Um, um, so, you had a four year between your recent so you saw your reviews. Did you have a full year? Yeah, did, I did actually. Did have any of you resubmitted like during that weird time where your eligibility so, is going to be up, but you don't know who your reviews are? Oh, yeah. I'm just try not to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the so the reviews I think will always come back yeah. before the next deadline. It just might not give you any time. Yeah, so like, I think I got my I think yeah. I got my yeah. reviews back from the December, or November, whatever that leap year submission date was. I think I got reviews back either the last week of February or the first week of March, and then the next deadline was the first or second week of April, something like that. So if I were resubmitting that quickly, it would yeah. have been really challenging. Um, so don't maybe try, try to yeah. structure your time so that you either get an earlier deadline the first time or you'll just do your resubmission at the later one. Yeah. And the big thing is, is you, you will get your um, summary statement significantly before uh, any sort of a decision. 
So that's that's the other thing that you have to be very careful about because if you have a score that's like on the edge, you really have to almost wait the extra couple months before you get the, the decision statement that says whether or not it's funded. And my understanding is as soon as you submit a um, kind of an amendment or a vision on that, then you kick yours out of the system in yeah. terms of, of that thing. So you want to make sure if you try to do something like that, that you know, you're definitely not going to get funded um, as best as possible. You're reminding me, this was my first contact with my PO, my program officer. It was after I got the summary statement, and I think my percentile was maybe like 13th percentile, and so it seemed like I was optimistic it could get yeah. funded, but also, you know, depending on the year and the um, institute, yeah. it would have been somewhere between like 10 and 20 percent most of the time, and who knows where it was going to be this year. And so I emailed him and said, this resubmission deadline is coming up in April, or this next submission deadline is coming up in April. Should I be ready to, you know, put it in addressing these concerns? And he said, I think that that would be a mistake because 13 percent is probably competitive. You might get reviewers that like it less if you, yeah. so, you know, like there's no guarantee that the exact same submission would get the same score. If it's an okay score, like take your chances and, and wait yeah. to see where the pay line is. And that was good advice. They can they can move stuff around too. So like that pay, like like in my example with the six percentile, the, the program officer was still like, I don't know, you never know. So like, yeah. they can choose to not fund highly scored, like mm -hmm. well scored applicants, and choose to fund people who are like you know twenty eighth percentile or whatever. So there's definitely flexibility there. Um, and that might have to do with the priorities. Yep. Of the institute. If you're really excited so, about the application. Yeah. Who knows. The other thing that I forgot that was funny and kind of a pain in the butt is that you have to, you have to list out all of your grades, like your your yes. science related classes. So I had to like go back and get a transcript from my undergrad institution to look up and report all my grades. And they will comment on them. Like they look at them. And so if you like tanked a class, you probably should say why, <laughs> I would think. Yeah. Well.